In the second video, I want to look into bond triangle diagram, which has uh, a triangle of this uh, shape. The x-axis is the average of electronegativity of two elements, and the y-axis is the absolute electronegativity. Now, if you are a strongly ionic uh, bond, then you tend to have high melting point, you are crystalline and brittle in nature, your solid does not conduct electricity, however, you might have slight conductivity of heat. If you are strongly covalent bond, then you should have low melting point, you are soft, and then you are poor conductors of both electricity and heat. Now, if you look at the x-axis, the extreme left is metallic characters, which are conductors and malleable. Extreme right are covalent bonds and compounds, which are insulators and soft. The tip of the and the top of the triangle is the ionic compounds, which they are electrolytes, they are molten and aqueous solution conduct electricity, and they tend to be hard solids. Now let's just look at a little bit more details, and this triangle here is semi-metals. So we have metallic, uh, copper and, and aluminum mixed is an alloy, then you have the blue shaded area which is covalent, and you have the yellow which is more ionic in character. Now, uh, this might have actually too much details, but if you concentrate on cesium, the most electro-positive, uh, the least electronegative, the most metallic, so cesium. And then if you look at fluorine, a diatomic halogen, this is extreme of covalency, 100% covalent, 0% ionic character. If you come up here, once you mix cesium and fluorine, you get cesium fluoride. That's the most ionic we have, and it's only 90% ionic. You still have 10% covalency in it. So there is no compound that is 100% ionic. On the other hand, we have compounds that are 100% covalent. Now let's look at the example of how to use this triangle. Uh, I'm going to compare two compounds, tin 2 chloride versus lead 2 chloride. Melting point of tin 2 chloride is lower than lead 2 chloride, so that already gives me a, a hint that tin 2 chloride should be more covalent. Let's just calculate uh, the average electronegativity. So I go after electronegativity for tin 2 chloride. We are going to add uh, electronegativity of tin to electronegativity of chlorine. Divide it by 2, so that's 5.2 divided by 2, you get 2.6. I'm going to come to x-axis and mark 2.6. Then let's just calculate the electronegativity difference, which is 3.2 take away 2, and you get 1.2. And we are going to mark 1.2. Now this cross section indicates where lead, uh, sorry, tin 2 chloride is. So I'm going to come up here and stop. This is where tin 2 chloride is. And if you come here, this is indicating that you have you have only about 30% ionic in character, give and take. So tin 2 chloride is 30% ionic in nature, and the remainder 70% is covalent. And that's a good indication why it has low melting point. So it has more covalent character. Now let's just look at lead 2 chloride. So PbCl2, we're going to do the same thing. The average electronegativity is that of lead plus chlorine, 3.2 plus 1.8 divided by 2, and you get 5 divided by 2, 2.5. Let me just change color, so 2.5 is right here. Now let's just calculate the absolute electronegativity, which is 3.2, take away 1.8, and you get 1.4. So we come here, and 1.4 is here. So now you should have more ionic in character, which you do, and if we find this cross section, that's where lead 2 is, which is right here. So this is where lead 2 chloride is, and it has more ionic character versus covalent character. This is about give and take. We are going to estimate it. It's 40% ionic and 60% covalent. Therefore, it has higher melting point because of that.
So this is how we are going to use this triangle. Your job is to estimate. Now the maximum is 90% ionic and the leftover is 10% is covalent. Once you come to 2, that's 50-50, 50, 50, 50 ionic, 50 covalent. If you come to electronegativity difference of 1.0, that means you are 25% ionic, 75% covalent. So it's a complementary scale that you have to be able to read.